today we will be discussing Dr. Swatika, Assistant Professor of What is the central dogma of molecular biology? Before going to the translation proper, we will be reading about what is the central dogma of molecular biology. Uh, it means that the message from the DNA has been transferred onto the RNA by way of a method, by way of transcription. And from DNA to DNA, the message can be transferred by way of replication. After transcription, the message has been transferred onto the RNA. And from the RNA, the message will be uh, transferred into the protein by way of what called translation. And we finally get the ultimate required or desired protein to bring about the various similar effects which are desired. So, what is translation? It is the process of translating the inserted sequence of an mRNA or messenger RNA into the sequence of amino acids with the corresponding specific protein. So the patient which uh, helps or aids in translation is the genetic protein. Here you can see the messenger RNA which is running in 5' to 3' direction to which so many bases, nucleotide bases are attached. A stands for adenine, G guanine, cytosyl and uracil. Cytosyl and uracil. Instead of uracil in DNA, we have time it. That has been replaced by uracil in RNA. So RNA, again RNA similar to DNA, is spread. The message is spread in a triplet genetic group. So here the three bases are being read. So if you take the example of here, PUA, that is cytosine, uracil, and adeno. Adenosine has been read, and the complementary to this basis has been found in the yeah, uh, the, the nucleus of the amino acid surrounding and the uh, complementary bases are being paired to the bases which are present in the mRNA. So G is mean one is paired with cytosine with three hydrogen bonds, adenine with uracil with two hydrogen bonds and uracil with adenine by two hydrogen bonds in the direction of three prime to prime, five prime. So this is the tRNA to which the incoming amino acid which has got sequences complementary to the bases present in the mRNA is attached. And the cRNA will aid in delivering the amino acids to the mRNA and helps in This is how proteins is been synthesized with the basic, with the codes present in the mRNA and we uh, recruit amino acids and the respective amino acids are synthesized resulting in formation of Polypeptide. The incoming tRNA carrying the amino acid, which has got to which the coding is complementary to the coding present in the next sequence of RNA. Next to CD. Translation ideally commences from 5' prime end of mRNA, that is from the amino terminal. So mRNA is basically read in 5' prime to 3' prime direction. In new carriers, translation mostly occurs in new phase. So what are the components required for translation? We have five major components. One is the mRNA or messenger RNA. Second is the tRNA, which carries the corresponding amino acid. The third one is the ribosomes. Ribosomes has got subunits. So 70 years uh, ribosome in case of prokaryotes play a role in translation and 80 years ribosome plays a role in translation in case of eukaryote. And other ribosomal proteins like RRNAs and uh, fourth factor is the protein factors which are helping helpful in translation which include eukaryotic initiation factor, eukaryotic elongation factor and RF restriction factor. First one is the energy source, ATP and GP. So here you can see, this is the mRNA, the spot a cap, by prime cap, teladenosin cap, and polyadenyl staining, the three prime region, after the untranslated region present in the three prime end. Here also you have got untranslated region in the five prime end, 
and the first codon which initiates is called as the starting codon which is encoded by A. So this is the coding region in the mRNA. So to which the subunits of ribosomes will come and associate to form the some ribosome and this will come and bind to different coding regions in the mRNA and initiate synthesis of simultaneous synthesis of polypeptide chain which is called amino acid chain. Prokaryotic ribosome has got two subunits, 50S subunit and 30S subunit to constitute the 70S ribosome. 50S subunit is made up of 23S ribosomal RNA, 5S ribosomal RNA and 35 proteins. 30S subunit is made up of 15S ribosomal RNA and 21 proteins. These subunits will associate to form the 70S ribosome. Eukaryotic ribosome is made up of 60S subunit and 40S subunit. It will constitute together to form the 80S ribosome. 60S subunit is made up of 28S RNA, ribosomal RNA, 5S RRNA, 5.8S RRNA and 14 proteins. And 40S subunit is made up of 18S RRNA and 33 proteins. Yes, is nothing but sped bucket is a measurement unit. This two will associate to form the 80S ribosomes. So this is the tRNA adapter molecule. It has got and four stems. One is the acceptor stem. Second one is the D loop. Third one is the anticodon loop. Fourth one is the variable loop. And sixth one is the P C loop. So this acceptor loop has got an amino acid sequence of C C A at its three prime end and a hydroxy group attached to the last last codon at the 3 prime end, which is the accepting uh, arm for the incoming amino acids to be associated to the polypeptide chain. This is the D loop and this is the anticodon loop. Here in the end has got sequences which is complementary to the bases present to the present in the mRNA to which it is which helps in uh, decoding the information present in the DNA. So this will go on bind to the this anticodon group will go on bind to the mRNA. So what are the steps in translation? So these are basically the most important or an outline of steps in translation. Activation of amino acids, initiation, elongation, termination and release, folding and post-translation and modification. So how do amino acids get activated? So an amino acid will be uh, activated by the enzyme amino acid tRNA synthetase. That is activation means by phosphorylation of amino acid. So a molecule of phosphate group will be attached to the incoming amino acid, making it activated with the help of enzyme amino acid tRNA synthetase. So uh, ultimately we get an amino acid tRNA. The incoming amino acid will acid after getting phosphorylated will be attached to the tRNA that is forming amino acid tRNA. This is the activation of amino acid. The second phase of translation after activation of amino acids includes initiation, elongation and termination. Initiation can be divided into four steps. First, ribosomal dissociation. First, before going and getting attached to the mRNA, ribosomes has to get dissociated dissociate itself. So if in case you take for the eukaryotes, 80s ribosome will get dissociated into its subunits 60s and 40s. And then happens the formation of 43s free initiation complex. Third one is for formation of 48s initiation complex. And fourth one is the formation of 80s initiation complex. So here you can see dissociation of 80s ribosome. So here 80s ribosome is dissociated into Yes and 40 yes by way of certain restriction factors or whatever which helps in the association of the ribosomal sub. Second one is the ternary complex formation. So the first codon, which is the AUG codon or the start codon, will encode for the first amino acid meteorite. And along with that, 
in eukaryotic fixation factor and also the dissociated subunit 40s which has got as a, uh, attached to the 3 and 1a factors along with this nucleonin and this eukaryotic factor 2c will get attached and form a ternary complex which is nothing but 43 years pre-initiation complex. So here you can see activation of mRNA. So this is how formation of 43 years pre-initiation complex. The third step is formation of 48 years pre so once this 43 s transition complex is formed, to which one more thing, mRNA. mRNA with its associated factors, A and 4B and 4F attached to the cap of mRNA will come and associated with the, will come and get associated itself to the 40 s subunit of ADS ribosome along with other factors which aid in translation and resulting in formation of 48 years initiation complex. After formation of uh, initiation complex, 48 years initiation complex, we have uh, another step where there is formation of 80 years initiation complex. Here you can see the mRNA, the starting codon, and the amino acid which encodes for the starting codon as metionine along with the a part of the ribosomal subunit and along with the factors. After this, what happens? 60S subunit, which is dissociated at the beginning, will come and associate itself to the 40S subunit to form the 80S initiation complex. Rest of the things remains the same. So what are the difference in initiation between the eukaryotes and prokaryotes? In eukaryotes, bind, while binding of mRNA to the 40S subunit, 5' prime end of cap will bind to the ternary complex and mRNA is scanned and it is positioned in such a way that uh, the incoming amino acid, the methionine, will be present at the P side of the ADS complex. And in prokaryotes, mRNA is not cap, shine dalgarno sequence upstream of the initiating AUG will bind to the complementary sequence of the 18S RRNA of the uh, subunit of ribosomal RNA, this is the prokaryotes. The first amino acid in the eukaryote is methionine, as in case of prokaryotes, it is formyl methionine. And the initiation factors involved in translation or initiation of translation in eukaryotes puts 12 or more. Whereas only three initiation factors play a role in translation in case of prokaryotes. And the ribosomal subunits are 40 years and 60 years constituently 80 years ribosomal RNA and 30 years in, in case of eukaryotes. And in case of prokaryotes, 30 years and 50 years together constituting 70 years in case of prokaryotes. <clears throat> the second step in translation is elongation. It is a cyclic process that is one amino acid will be added at one time. And it has three major steps. First step is binding of the amino acyl gRNA, that is activated amino acyl gRNA to the A site of the ATS initiation complex. And then what happens? There will be a peptide bond formation with the initiating amino acid methionine present in the P site and with the incoming, incoming amino acid gRNA at the A site. And then what happens? This amino acid present in the A site will get translocated to the P site after peptide bond formation resulting in a dipeptide. So here you can see ADS subunit in the has got P site and e associated with mRNA has got two sites, P site and A site. A site is where the coming tRNA with its anti codon complementary to the codon present in the mRNA will come and bind with the coming amino acid attached to its extra step. So this is the initiator, initiating codon AUG. So whichever tRNA with the initiating amino acid methionine will be has already come and attached. So once this comes and attached, what happens? There will be a peptide formation between the 
this sequence CCG will hold for the amino acid proline. So hence, after it is coming unattached, then there will be a peptide formation to meet your And after this happens, there will be a translocation of this entire proline from this tRNA, charged tRNA. We can say that activated tRNA is charged tRNA onto the meat unit and this tRNA will be L3 and it will move to the E type to get released. So here again you can see A site, B site and E site. So peptidyl tRNA with the first Yan amino acid will come and attach to the B site and then the incoming tRNA will come and attach to the A site, peptidyl formation and the translocation of the amino acid N-1 to the B site. So this tRNA then moves to the E site and this uh, sequence of amino acids again will attach to the tRNA present in the B site which got shifted from the A site and that is how peptide bond formation and translocation of tRNA and charged tRNA will happen and then from E site the uncharged tRNA will get released. So during this process we need energy source which is nothing but GTP. So here this is a step one which is binding of amino acid tRNA to the A site. Here A site and plus one amino acid is coming, last tRNA is coming and binding with the anticodon on the tRNA and codon on the mRNA. Second step is peptide bond formation. That is the whole sequence of amino acids present in the tRNA in the B site gets uh, forms bond with the income already uh, bound uh, amino acid is the A site and then this will get shifted to this and here so hence the tRNA present in the B site is free of amino acid. Then translocation. So now you can see this of the newly synthesized polypeptide with everything is present in the tRNA in the A site. Now what happens, this entire molecule will get translocated from the A site to the B site. And this A site is now free to receive the incoming amino acid present in the charged tRNA. So for the entire process at each step, we need JP, GTP. Energetics. Uh, equivalent of a four high energy bonds. The charging of tRNA molecule with the amino acid moiety requires is the hydrolysis of an ATP to an AMP. So two phosphate molecules are attached. And the entry of amino acid tRNA into the AC is such a hydrolysis of one GTP to GTP. And translocation of the newly formed peptidyl tRNA in the A site into the B site results in hydrolysis of GTP to GTP. So in the first step during charging of tRNA molecule, two phosphate groups. And the second and third step, one one phosphate group is being utilized. So totally four phosphate groups has been utilized. And the third final step of translation is termination. Termination happens when there is a stop codon appearing in the A site. So no tRNA with an anticodon will be available for recognizing the termination signal. So the releasing factor F1 will recognize the stop codon in A site. Here you can see the animation. I'll play it again. So here there is a, um, what to say, first uh, there is a P site tRNA to which there is a attached amino acid and there is translocation of, uh, after peptide bond formation, translocation of this amino acid tRNA to the P site. And here UGA is one of the stop codon and there is no tRNA available to recognize it. So what happens? This uh, release factor will come and bind to the stop codon and cause dissociation of all the ribosomes and then replacing this as polypeptide chain from the mRNA. And now the mRNA is free. This is how termination of translation occurs. So here you can see again, this is the stop codon at the B side. Or the entire polypeptide chain is attached to the tRNA, which is uh, present. And to this top codon, there is no tRNA recognition because no tRNA is available, which can uh, recognize this top codon. 
and now here comes into the picture the releasing factor as well as the energy ATP come and bind and this will cause dissociation of the subunits of ribosomes and also dissociation of the nucleosynthesis polypeptide chain from the tRNA and hence we get the free polypeptide chain free tRNA free ribosomal subunits 40 years and 60 years and other factors which favor in termination of translation and the mRNA. So polysomes, what are polysomes are multiple ribosomes which are present in the same mRNA molecule form a polyribosome. Hence a single mRNA molecule is copied into a, a big protein molecule. So here you can see uh, mRNA to which so many ribosomes get associated and results in formation of polypeptide this will say the desired polypeptide of this region and here it was say the polypeptide of this region and similarly here it will say the polypeptide of regulation of translation so most genes are regulated at the level of transcription itself, but some are regulated at the level of initiation of translation and others are by altering the stability of mRNA. So regulation of rate of translation. Uh, here the initiation is being regulated by regulation of eukaryotic initiation factor 4E, which controls the rate of initiation. So initiation factor 4E and 4E binding protein. So when insulin is acting upon this, this will cause kinase activation and release of and phosphorylation of 4E binding protein and release of 4E binding protein from the eukaryotic initiation factor and 4E. This eukaryotic initiation factor 4E also got phosphorylated to which the eukaryotic initiation factor 4G will come and bind. And after this, there is an incoming of eukaryotic initiation factor 4A, which will all together form the eukaryotic initiation factor 4F complex. This 4F complex is required for attachment to the mRNA cap. This is how it regulates. So when there is no phosphorylation happening, this whole, this complex cannot form and which cannot go and bind with the cap of mRNA. So here you can see, here you can see how ferritin synthesis is regulated at the translation level. So this is the ion response element binding protein, this orange color. And this is the ion response element, this uh, elongation or imagination in the pipeline end of MRN. So whenever there is uh, no ion, we don't want ion to be stored as ferritin. We want the ion to be replaced. So what happens? Whenever there is low ion, there is no translation of ferritin protein happening. Hence, we can't store ion as ferritin. Whenever there is high ion the circulation, this ion will go and bind with ion response element binding protein and will cause free ion response element present in the mRNA end, enabling translation of ferritin protein. So viruses and untranslation. So viruses replicate using host cell protein synthesizing machinery which includes encephalomyocarditis virus, rheovirus, vesicular stomatitis virus, and polio and picorna virus, which disrupt the function of 4F complex. So already we have seen how 4F complex will uh, regulate the initiation of translation. So here, polio virus will cause dissociation of 4E from 4G, and there is no formation of 4F complex. So, this 4E and 4G will cause, will go and bind to ion response element. So, we uh, separated the unimolecular 4G, if it goes and binds, it will favor translation. Whereas, there is no binding, there is no translation happening. Stability of mRNA, how stability of mRNA will um, influence the translation. So, mRNA has got one more entity. There is an one more entity called microRNA, which degrades the target mRNA or blocks translation of target mRNA. So mRNA of eukaryotes is relatively stable, by, which is brought about by poly-A tailing 
and the second one is it binds to proteins that prevents its degradation. Antibiotics and translation. How do antibiotics uh, affect translation? Tetracyclines will prevent binding of amino acid tRNA to the ASI, hence translation could not happen. Chloramphenicol will bind 23 years ribosome and RNA and inhibits its peptidyl transferase activity. Diphtheria toxin will catalyze ADP ribosylation of elongation factor 2 and inactivates it and resin will inactivate 28 years ribosomal RNA. Erythromycin and clindamycin will bind bacterial 50 years ribosomal subunit. Streptomycin will bind bacterial 30 years ribosomal subunit. Cyclohexamide will inhibit peptidyl transferase activity in 60 years ribosomal subunit. And next last part is protein folding and post translation process. So once the protein polypeptide chain has been synthesized, it has to be folded into a biologically active form. So to achieve or assume its native conformation with the formation of appropriate hydrogen bonds, Van der Waals process, and ionic and hydrophobic interactions to form a functional protein. So in this way, the linear mRNA is converted into a three-dimensional structure of a protein. Some newly made proteins do not attain their finally biologically active conformation. They have been altered by some of the processing reactions before that called as post-translational modification. So, amino and carboxy terminal modifications. So, again, methionine capping at the fibrin end and piquitin uh, attachment at the uh, carboxy terminal end. These all will determine the fate of the protein. If the piquitin is attacked, it is subjected to proteolytic cleavage in inside this tapron molecule in need of eukaryotes and there's uh, methionine attachment I mean for capping and loss of signal sequence is one of the post translation modification happen the modification of individual amino acids phosphorylation of serine and threonine can happen gamma carboxylation and hydroxylation also would happen, which is also come under post translation quality. And glycosylation, attachment of carbohydrate side chains to the protein can also happen. Either it can be a mannose groups or a galactose group or muraminic acid, n glucosamine or n galactosamine. And proteolytic processing, like in case of zymogens, it has to get uh, protein undergo proteolytic cleavage to produce the active protein to uh, produce its desired action, which happens in case of digestive enzymes, clotting factors, where zymogen or inactive precursor is converted to the active protein. And addition of prosthetic groups, addition of isoprenyl groups, formation of disulfide cross-links, as in case of glutathione and also in insulin. So these are the post-translation modifications which happen after translation of protein before it gets uh, converted into a native biologically functional protein. And with this translation is over. Thank you.